the um, all the stuff around COVID and being remote that didn't really happen. And so just glad to be able to at least virtually visit um, the CSL lab and, and see everybody. Um, and kind of going off of what Jordan um, was saying, like I, I, I don't know if we have undergrads in the audience today, but I was an undergrad at, at Cornell and I kind of just wanted to spend um, a minute or two just kind of uh, looking back at um, at least my personal journey. And I think there's a lot of people in the audience right now that, are, that have been a big part of that journey. And so kind of when I was starting Cornell, actually my first computer science and engineering experience was taking this introduction to engineering um, ENGRI 1210 class, um, computing inside your smart, smartphone. And I'm not sure if the curriculum's changed, but we use kind of like this LC3 like simulator for doing um, actually programmed breakout like a breakout game in assembly language. And yeah, that was just like an amazing experience to kind of expose me to this whole new world of computing that at least I at the time I hadn't thought about whatsoever. Um, and kind of going from there, um, I started getting interested in other ways of getting involved in computing research. So working with Professor Zhang and looking at um, how do we do agile hardware development using Halo synthesis I was trying to find fun pictures from, from my time at Cornell. Um, and the, the one that uh, kind of stuck out at me was this poster picture that we had at the Seek workshop at DAC um, back in 2015. Um, and then obviously like a shout out to all of the, all the professors and classes and opportunities to kind of TA and be part of that culture as well, kind of being able to look at the spectrum of CS classes and ECE classes um, across the computing stack, including digital logic design, VLSI, embedded systems, ASIC design, resilient computer systems, computer architecture, and advanced computer architecture. Um, and kind of just building off of some of that experience and looking at hardware design. Um, some of my early graduate research when I was starting out was really looking at how do we use high-level synthesis to design ASICs for the domain of uh, machine learning or deep neural networks. So one of my first projects um, was uh, being part of this larger um, uh, ASIC design and tape that we had in our lab called SM4, which was designing flexible DNN acceleration techniques for IoT devices. And following from that, I started thinking about, well, in addition to kind of some of the fully connected and convolutional applications that, that we were looking at at the time, where else can we look at um, using deep learning and accelerating them? And so started working on speech recognition and there we had a study um, called Maser, thinking about how do we maximize the performance and energy efficiency of speech recognition on chip. And so we were looking at sparse recurrent neural networks and designing hardware for that. And then kind of towards the tail end of that project, um, I started thinking about, well, where else can we see interesting problems for optimizing um, machine learning and deep learning? And over the course of you know, a couple of years um, and talking to some of our collaborators and kind of having um, various conversations um, with people um, in, in companies, we, we came across this use case of personalized recommendation, which is really kind of the, the focus of what I wanted to talk about today. So the first question, what is recommendation? Um, so personalized recommendation is actually all around us, whether we um, see it on a, uh, or think about it on a daily basis or not. But personalized recommendation is really the task of recommending new content to users based on their personal preferences. So we see this everywhere around us, whether it's um, health applications or fitness applications, um, but also we see this in many internet services that we're using on a daily basis. For instance, um, personalized recommendation enables Netflix and YouTube to uh, recommend what videos and what content you might wanna watch next. It's used by Amazon and Alibaba and, and Google search on, um, uh, e-commerce platforms and what products we might want to buy next and obviously on, on search platforms as well. And it also powers how Facebook ranks um, our, all of our social media posts that show up on um, newsfeed. 
And in fact, we, we've seen recent estimates that are, that are saying that these recommendation algorithms are responsible for 35% of all purchases on Amazon and 75% of all videos watched on Netflix. Now, given this economic impact, uh, what we're starting to see is that modern methods of recommendation are starting to use these, these deep learning based solutions in order to improve user experiences by providing higher degrees of personalization. So what does this mean for a, a systems um, researcher or an architect? Um, so in addition to this economic impact, what we're starting to see is that recommendation is consuming the majority of AI cycles and infrastructure capacity at the data center scale. So this makes them a really crucial workload to, to study and optimize and accelerate. So here, just as kind of um, an example of this, uh, this widespread use, we're gonna look at recommendation systems in Facebook's data centers. And what we end up finding is that recommendation accounts for 50% of all AI training cycles and 80% of all AI inference cycles in Facebook's data centers. Now, if you kind of aggregate all of the recommendation cycles together, what we're starting to see is that almost over 200 trillion inferences are done for recommendation alone every day at, at the data center scale. This is just a massive amount of compute and energy that's kind of going into powering these services. On the other hand, we're also starting to see that um, the model sizes and capacity requirements for production scale recommendation models is also growing very rapidly. So in just the past three years alone, we've seen that production scale recommendation models have grown um, in size by a factor of 10x and by compute intensity by a factor of 100x. So in, in addition to kind of the, the growth in the size of these workloads, we're also seeing that the amount of infrastructure that's devoted to these applications is also growing. So in the past um, year and a half, we've seen the number of training racks has increased by almost a factor of 4x. Okay, so kind of given this, the capacity demand for recommendation, what we're starting to see is that optimizing for personalized recommendation is crucial to the um, efficiency of AI at the data center scale. So in this talk, what um, I like to outline is the different opportunities and paths available to optimizing recommendation inference, along with some of the recent work that we've done along this road and um, part of this journey. So first, uh, we'll talk about what do these state-of-the-art deep learning recommendation models look like, then we'll kind of look at what are the architectural challenges to efficiently deploy these models. And given these unique challenges, uh, we'll do a, a bit of a deep dive on a particular set of uh, scheduling and hardware design optimizations that we can um, look at for efficient recommendation across heterogeneous hardware at the data center scale. And now one of the challenges for conducting research in recommendation has historically been the lack of open source benchmarks and tools and resources. And so what a large part of our work has been around has is how can we make these workloads and benchmarks and tools and resources as accessible and as available to the broader community as possible. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the recent efforts that we've um, been doing on kind of democratizing recommendation systems research. And then finally, time permitting, I'd like to share some of our work on uh, going beyond efficiency and looking at how can we design responsible recommendation systems and particularly looking at some of the sustainability implications of, um, of computing and data centers. Okay, so I'll start with deep learning recommendation models. And I might've forgotten this, but uh, definitely feel free to jump in at any point. Um, we can definitely keep this a lot more conversational. So if you have any questions at any point, definitely feel free to jump in. Cool, okay. So starting with what do these deep learning recommendation models look like? So to better understand the unique characteristics of recommendation, here we'll take a look at an example. So. As an example here, we have an e-commerce platform, uh, which has the goal of recommending which books you, a user might wanna buy or read next. 
And before we can answer that question, what we'll look at is what is the likelihood or how do we model the likelihood that a user is gonna like a particular book um, found on one of these platforms? Now the decision um, or this, this modeling is based on a set of both continuous and dense features, but also categorical and sparse features. So examples of continuous and dense features are, uh, are inputs like the age of the user or the time of day that the user is interacting with the e-commerce platform. And then dense features are processed by uh, DNN such as uh, multi-layer perceptrons or fully connected layers or uh, convolutional layers and, um, and, and so on. Now examples of categorical or sparse features are things like the user search history or the book's genre. Now categorical features are represented as multi-hot encoded vectors. For example, a, for the user's history um, at the top over here, um, A1 represents all the books that the user has visited in the recent past. And similarly, A1 in the book genre represents um, different identifiers for the book. So in this case, Harry Potter has uh, magic in it and is part of a longer series. Now, the, the size of these multi-hot encoded vectors is set by the total number of categories, which ranges um, all the way up to tens or hundreds of millions of, of entries in production workloads. But we as like individual people and, and users only really ever sample a very small um, subset of this overall space. And what this really means is that these multi-hot encoded vectors are not only very large, but also incredibly sparse. And operating on sparse data is very difficult. And so our, our first goal is to transform this sparse input into a dense one. Now, one way of doing this is using embedding tables. The key idea here is that entries in the multi-hot encoded vectors are used to index, row, index rows within the embedding table. And these lookups result in dense embedding vectors, which represent learned feature representations of each of the categories. Now, these embedding vectors are aggregated together using different operations, such as sum or averaging. The output of these are then combined with the output of dense DNNs. And then finally, a stack of predictor DNNs produces the likelihood that the user will like a, a particular book. So in this case, we're seeing that um, this user has a 90% chance of, of liking um, the Harry Potter book, or at least the first Harry Potter book. Now the red box here is um, annotating the overall DNN-based recommendation model, which is used to rank the probability that the user is positively interacting with this input item. But this is just for a single book. For production scale recommendation services, we see that we can have potentially tens of thousands of potential books or items um, that, could be that could be presented to individual users. And the combination of having a large number of items to rank with uh, models with large capacity, having maybe billions of parameters um, and serving potentially billions of users worldwide imposes stark performance and research challenges um, in order to deploy recommendation services efficiently at the data center scale. And that's kind of where we start looking at um, the next part of this talk, which is what are the unique architectural challenges for efficient recommendation, at least compared to some of the other AI workloads that our community has been studying. I'll take a brief pause there in case there's any questions. I have a quick question. So uh, I think there are some other deep learning models for recommendation system, like graph neural networks. And uh, so the I think the architectural challenge, challenges for graph neural network will be quite different from the models that you talk about. Yeah, that's for a example, the sparsity. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, so there's definitely a lot of emerging models for recommendation, um, graph neural networks being one of them. Um, I think towards the end of the, the talk, I'll kind of touch upon um, some of the use cases of graph neural networks. Uh, so the, the way that we've actually been looking at graph neural networks is that they, they kind of sit at the input of some of these other deep learning methods that we're talking about, and they feed into the, the embedding lookups 
um, for these deep learning based recommendation models. So they kind of add this extra layer of complexity in how to produce these embedding operations or these embedding tables. But yeah, that's a great point that they they have very different characteristics in terms of all these graph properties and um, all the kind of the opportunities that you can kind of think about for hardware design that are, are quite different. Okay, okay. I, I'm just curious about, um, so in terms of the state of that um, deep learning models for recommended system, is the model that you talk about is better or the graph neural network is better? Yeah, okay. So the question being, what are kind of like the state of the art recommendation models and yeah. how do you can trade off these different decisions. So graph neural networks are definitely um, one of these emerging algorithms. There's been a lot of evidence that they're um, especially good when you have huge amounts of data and especially structured data. Um, one of the challenges though that we're starting to see is that um, there's actually a performance penalty that you get by having these graph neural networks and the, the wider deployment of them is actually kind of bottlenecked on the training and the inference performance of these workloads. So at least currently, and maybe for um, the foreseeable near-term future, um, we're, we're seeing that these deep learning models are still very relevant, but definitely kind of looking ahead to the horizon, um, graph neural networks are gonna become more and more important as well. That's kind of a, a great systems and architectural um, research problem to have, I think, as, as computer architects to kind of look at these emerging models as well. Okay, thanks. Cool, so um, I wanted to talk about some of the key challenges to efficient recommendation. And at least the, the way that I like to think about this is um, there's, there's four main buckets or categories of key challenges. The first being these embedding operations and the new um, compute paradigms that they introduced to the AI pipeline. And there's model heterogeneity for the different use cases. There's hardware heterogeneity that we're seeing at the data center scale. And then the fact that we're deploying these models um, at the data center scale um, and having these kind of latency sensitive or latency critical workloads um, that introduces new challenges as well. And um, so our, our lab has been kind of working across the spectrum on addressing these different challenges. And the, the rest of this talk is kind of, kind of is going to step through a lot of the, um, the work that we've been doing um, in this vein. Um, but what I like to do is start kind of with looking at the key challenges that are introduced by uh, embedding workups. So like we've kind of alluded to in the past, um, these embedding table operations pose new challenges for efficient recommendation or efficient hardware design. And first um, to, to look at this, we can see the, the storage capacity, right? So here on the vertical axis, we're comparing embedding tables or embedding operations with convolutional fully connected and recurrent layers. And on the horizontal axis, we're measuring capacity in megabytes. And what we're finding is that these embedding tables have orders of magnitude higher storage requirement. In fact, some of these production recommendation models are um, going up to tens or hundreds of gigabytes of storage. In addition to capacity, we can also look at compute intensity. So on the vertical axis, we have the same operations. And on the horizontal axis here, we're measuring the compute intensity in terms of flops per byte. And we're finding that embedding tables also have orders of magnitude lower compute intensity compared to convolutional fully connected and recurrent layers. And then finally, um, we can also consider memory access patterns. So on the horizontal axis here, we have cache miss rates as measured by MPKI. And given their sparse and irregular memory accesses, we find that embedding tables have orders of magnitude higher cache miss rates. So what does this mean in terms of new hardware designs. Well, um, what, what I think is that the, this kind of opens up a whole new area of opportunities um, to address these unique challenges for systems and hardware um, optimization for these workloads. So in terms of um, memory capacity, we need to start thinking about um, the end-to-end -end memory systems, including uh, DRAMs and non volatile memories and flash-based systems in order to store these massive models. 
for given kind of the low compute intensity, maybe start thinking about different types of accelerator designs, perhaps looking towards near memory computing. And then finally, given the irregular memory access patterns, can we think about specialized caching or prefetching capabilities uh, customized for these workloads? Kind of building off of some of these challenges, I wanted to briefly kind of give an overview for some of the recent work that we've been doing on targeting optimizing these embedding operations in particular. Um, so on the left here, uh, what we're looking at is REC NMP, which is a near memory processing um, based accelerator for embedding operations out of DRAM. So these embeddings are stored in DRAM and they have a specialized cache in order to um, store frequently accessed vectors. And the near memory processing module um, is meant to accelerate the, the aggregation operations within these embeddings. And what we're seeing is that this can reduce latency for DRAM-based inference after some minutes. And on the right, we're seeing REC SSD, which is a flash-based solution where we're actually augmenting the, the um, flash translation layer in order to cache some of the frequency access vectors, but also um, do the embedding op aggregation operations once again, um, as close to the SSD as possible. And this is really targeting for models that are going beyond the um, DRAM capacity available on commodity platforms and looking towards um, these much larger models. So if you're interested in this work, I definitely encourage you to um, take a look at some of our work. It um, should be available online now. Uh -huh. but yeah. Okay, so the second category being model heterogeneity. So here we're looking at the general architecture of recommendation networks and the key components of this general architecture are highlighted in red for MLPs, in blue for the embedding table uh, operations and green for the feature interaction operations. And by configuring these different components of the network, we can realize very different implementations of recommendation models. So for instance, the compute intensity of the model is set based on the depth and width of the DNN stacks. The memory intensity of the model can be set based on the number of unique embedding tables and the number of lookups per table. And then the communication patterns within the networks are set based on the different types of feature interaction operations. So here we can actually look at how configuring these different components can realize very different types of networks. So embedding dominated models to start with are characterized with having um, tens of embedding tables each of which has tens of hundreds of lookups per um, table as highlighted in blue here. And then on the other hand, we can have MLP dominant models, um, which typically have one hot encoded lookups or at least very few um, lookups per table with large MLP layers and sometimes even multiple output predictor DNN stacks in order to predict not just the likelihood that the user is going to like um, a particular item, but maybe the likelihood that they might share it with their friends or post about it or write about it. Um, and that like more richness of um, output um, predictions. And then finally, we can have attention boundaries models, which also have um, fewer lookups per table, but have very complex feature interaction layers, such as attention-based or recurrent layers that are highlighted in green here. So all these different types of models are used across different internet services, such as social media, search, e-commerce, and entertainment. And here we can actually look at the performance characteristics of eight industry representative models across uh, Facebook, Google, and Alibaba's data centers on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the operator breakdown for each of these models. So as expected across the different recommendation models, we find a very diverse set of operator breakdowns. And this imposes a, a diverse collection of system bottlenecks that must be collectively optimized in order to improve the efficiency of recommendation um, at the data center scale. And in fact, here we're only looking at a single batch size of about 64, but if we consider a much wider spectrum of query sizes, we find that the bottlenecks are um, the, the the design space becomes even wider um, on top of this as well. Okay, so moving to our next set of challenges in terms of hardware heterogeneity, 
Um, in the context of hardware acceleration, we're seeing that there's a Cambrian explosion of specialized AI hardware. So we have um, proposals for using CPUs, for using GPUs, for TPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs um, for AI in, in data centers. And to kind of look at what some of the trade-offs can be between processing queries on, on CPUs and accelerators, um, we're gonna use um, some commodity platforms as an example. In particular, we'll use some different types of um, commodity GPUs to model this AI accelerator. So here we're actually looking at the performance of a Cascade Lake CPU and two GPUs, um, the 1080 Ti and a inference T4 GPU over um, the, the, the performance improvement of those hardware platforms over a baseline Broadwell CPU. And on the vertical axis, we're seeing the same eight models that we talked about before. And on the horizontal axis, we have different batch sizes. So all the way from one to 16 things. And in the different colored boxes, we're seeing the optimal hardware platform in order to run the different uh, models given the batch size. And then particular numbers are really showing us um, what the speed up is over the Broadwell hardware. And the key takeaway, I mean, the, the numbers look um, kind of all over the place, but the key takeaway here is that the optimal hardware platform really varies based on the model architecture and also the input bass size, so like some of these runtime characteristics that we have for these workloads. And so if you're gonna, if you're thinking about how to efficiently run from these models in, in data centers, you kind of have to think about some of these scheduling decisions and how can we map these models onto hardware that's available to us. And then finally, we have the um, ASCAL deployment characteristics. So really quickly, just one of the key components of recommendation is that ranking more items improves recommendation quality. And improved quality leads to better user experiences. And so in order to rank more items, we find that these recommendation systems are optimized for high throughput. But in order to preserve user experiences, um, we're also seeing that recommendation inference must also meet strict latency targets. Now balancing these two different um, performance targets, we find that recommendation engines are really optimized for latency bounded throughput. Unfortunately, when we think about maximizing throughput and minimizing latency, they're, they're often at odds with one another. So one of the ways that you can maximize throughput is to increase batching. Another way is to think about co-locating multiple models and improving the efficiency of individual hardware platforms. So here on the x-axis, we're actually increasing the degree of co-located models on, um, a, on, on different CPUs. And on the, the y-axis, sorry, we have uh, latency as measured in milliseconds. And here we're looking at Broadwell in, in purple and um, Skylake processors in, in blue or green. And what we see is that by co-locating multiple models in the same platform, this is going to improve our overall throughput. But we also introduce a high degree of performance variability in the form of P99 latency. We're actually seeing that this high variability is um, coming from the memory system contention caused by these irregular memory accesses found in embedding lookups. This variability also depends on the underlying hardware platform. So here we're seeing the um, like both Broadwell and Skylake have very different cache organizations, and that's causing a um, a difference in how the systems respond to higher degrees of co-location and their impact on performance variability. So in particular, Broadwell has these inclusive caches which experience a higher um, sudden decrease in, um, or sudden, sudden degradation in tail latency when you have higher degrees of co-location. On the other hand, Skylake, has this more gradual degradation given their exclusive cache hierarchies. I guess more generally, this is to kind of say that when we're thinking about maximizing throughput and tail latency for these workloads, we really need to co-design um, 
how these models are being run on different hardware platforms and how do we think about maximizing throughput and minimizing tail latency for, for these workloads. And kind of putting all of this together, it kind of leads into the next part of our discussion today, which is how can we design systems and hardware for recommendation inference? So in particular, I wanna focus um, most of the discussion on this um, recent work that we had called DeepRexis, which is a system for en optimizing end-to-end -end scale recommendation. Um, and then later, um, I'll give a brief overview for some of our ongoing work on designing hardware accelerators for this as well. So um, the question that we're interested in answering is how could we maximize inference QPS with these diverse models and hardware platforms um, and strict latency targets? So when we set out to look at this question, we didn't have a lot of benchmarks or infrastructure to, to build off of and, and explore some of these research solutions. So the first thing that we ended up doing was actually building this, this infrastructure and building um, the deep access infrastructure in particular. Um, so what does this infrastructure do? It first implements a load generator that samples query arrival and size distributions based on characterizations of production data centers. And the, the load generator then produces queries that the scheduler determines how to process in order to maximize latency bounded throughput. For example, if a query is sufficiently large, the scheduler is gonna send it off to an accelerator to be processed. Otherwise, the scheduler can kind of split up that query across multiple CPU cores in order to parallelize processing individual queries. And then finally, these queries are processed by a variety of different recommendation models. Now, um, the scheduler in particular in the middle over here is designed to maximize inference QPS by parallelizing the query processing over all available CPU cores and accelerator resources. And to study the different scheduling decisions, we use um, we can actually configure the dis infrastructure to study a wide set of use cases. For example, we can um, on the left of the slide over here, we can um, extend the load generator to look at different input query patterns. Um, the collection of models can be extended to analyze and optimize ones with different performance bottlenecks. So if you were kind of interested in looking at graph neural networks. Uh, I think that somebody had pointed out earlier, you can kind of augment this infrastructure to um, implement those models as well. And then finally, like these models are run on a different, um, on a variety of different hardware systems, including general purpose CPUs and um, emulated accelerators. And so you can consider the ASCIL implications of that as well. So here we're, we're looking at the implication of varying um, the model architecture and the heterogeneous hardware on recommendation. And one of the crucial components of the infrastructure that we developed is actually this load generator. Um, so this load generator samples two things, the query arrival pattern and size distributions uh, based on real production data center characterizations. Um, now the arrival distribution follows what we would consider or what we would expect in terms of a uh, Poisson distribution. However, the size distribution follows something quite different. Um, and here to consider um, the range of possible realistic query sizes for recommendation, uh, we profiled um, the different sizes that we were seeing in some of these production data centers. And um, so here you're actually looking at a, a, a histogram of those query sizes. So on the x-axis, we have the query sizes, and on the y-axis, we have the frequency. And we find that the majority of the um, query sizes fall between this kind of the left part of the plot um, between the 100 and 200. But at the same time, you have this really long, um, heavy tail that goes all the way up to query sizes of about 1,000. This means that you can have up to a thousand items to rank per query or per user. And we also overlaid um, uh, log normal distributions, just kind of do that comparison. And what we're seeing is that um, these log normal distributions, which we see in other data center services, um, also have this heavy tail, but it's not as pronounced necessarily as some of these recommendation services. 
And given these, this like much heavier Taylor distribution, um, these, these heavier, these larger queries at the end of the tail are the ones that require the most work to be processed. And they're the ones that are, that are limiting the achievable system throughput under strict latency charges. And so the question that we kind of ask is what new system design or um, opportunities does this expose? And um, in particular, what we're gonna look at is how can we parallelize these large queries across um, different cores or offloading them through two accelerators to maximize the performance. Maybe I'll just stop there again in case there's other questions. Um, yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so it seems like there could be two types of applications, maybe taking Facebook as an example, some of the recommendation inference seems like it might not have to happen low latency or synchronously, like say you could get a user's news feed overnight while they're, they're not browsing Facebook. So, and then some of them seem like they do have to happen directly when a user clicks on some button. So I'm wondering if those actually, do you handle those differently or would those be scheduled differently um, or yeah, I guess, is that actually considered in the system design? Yeah, great question. So kind of how does this latency target affect the system design? And that's something that we definitely thought about. Um, and part of the study was actually looking at recent work from um, not just Facebook, but also like Google and Alibaba. And what we found is that everybody kind of had different latency targets based on their services. So like search has a very low latency target of about like 10 milliseconds. And um, for social media applications, that's closer to like hundreds of milliseconds, like three to 400 is kind of the target that we were looking at. Um, and then there's other platforms that are kind of sitting in, in the middle between that as well. And then I think Jordan, as you mentioned, there's um, use cases where maybe you can do everything offline. So your latency target is um, not, it's not a latency critical workload. It's more of like a throughput or a batch oriented workload. Um, and what we did find is that some of the scheduling decisions do heavily depend on, um, on those latency targets. And so that's another part of like, if you're thinking about designing systems for different services, then that's an important part that you have to kind of consider. And that not only changes the scheduling decisions, but maybe how you're going to design hardware itself. Great, that makes sense. Any other questions? Okay then, um, so I, I, I kind of mentioned this uh, scheduler and the different um, decisions that it can make uh, for the different use cases. So, uh, so looking back at this, uh, the schedule is really designed to consider different parallelization opportunities by splitting these queries across the available hardware platforms. So first here, we're gonna look at how the scheduler can, this, can split queries across uh, multi-core CPUs. So here's an example, we have a scheduler processing an input query size of, of 1024. And if the scheduler determines the per core query size to be 1024, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, if the scheduler determines the per core query size to be 1024 as well, that means that the query is processed as one unit or one batch. Now separately, the uh, scheduler can determine to split this query up into four batches of uh, 256 items each. Now this um, decreases the amount of data level parallelism, but increases the amount of thread level parallelism that um, our systems can export. So what are the performance implications of this? So on the x-axis, we have this per core query size or this uh, per core batch size, um, if that's easier to think about. And the far left axis, we have small sizes, which means that you have low data level parallelism, but high thread level parallelism. And on the right side of the um, x-axis, we have high data level parallelism and low thread level parallelism. And in blue here, we're seeing the performance of an embedding dominated model with varying query size, um, with varying query sizes and uh, 100 millisecond SLA target. And what we're seeing is that the optimum query size threshold um, in order to split these larger queries up into is about 512. In small query sizes, uh, 
incur higher cumin delays, while larger ones are going to have longer latencies and limiting the max the maximum QPS that we can achieve under this SLA target. But for different workloads, like if we have an MLP dominant model and an attention dominant model, we find that the inference QPS is actually maximized at very different free size thresholds. And Jordan, I think going off of your point, um, in, the, in, in our study, what we ended up finding is that the optimal point not only varies across these different models, but also across the different SLA targets. Um, so we looked at uh, what the reported SLA targets were for different use cases like social media or search. Um, and we did find that the optimum query size threshold was very different. Now, given this diversity, what you really need is some sort of automated solution and framework in order to uh, determine these batching configurations. And so for that, what we, based on some of this characterization, what we find is that um, a relatively simple hill climbing based scheduler can automatically find this optimum per query size. Now this is a, um, a simpler hill climbing based uh, scheduler, but if you were to kind of expand this design space, um, you could also consider other sorts of machine learning automated techniques to kind of find these optimated configurations as well. But kind of building off of this hill climbing scheduler, we find that the scheduler can flexibly optimize the latency band of throughput across different use cases, including different models, um, different SLA targets, and also different hardware platforms, at least commodity CPUs. So, so far we kind of talked about the commodity hardware platforms or commodity CPUs, but um, we can also consider offloading these queries to an accelerator. So here the question is, given this heavy tail distribution and, um, and the histogram that we looked at before, um, at which point are these query sizes large enough in order to offload them to coprocessors? Or in particular here, we looked at GPU-based um, hardware, but you can um, replace some of these results or study different types of either emulated or um, different types of ASICs as well. So here we're measuring the impact of tuning this threshold to offload queries to the GPU versus processing them on um, the CPU on your inference QPS. And we find that the optimum query, query size threshold for this MLP dominant model is about 180. And there's another point that I think is really interesting here, which is this vertical, um, uh, this vertical line at around 37. So that is actually the inflection point at which the GPU in an isolated case, not with these latency uh, constraints or the query size distributions, just like in an isolated offline case, is the point at which the GPU starts to outperform the CPU. And the big difference between the 37 and the 180 um, really highlights the point that we that we need to be considering some of these ASCAL characteristics when we're scheduling these workloads on, on, hard, on different hardware platforms. So in addition to this, um, we actually did find, kind of similar to some of our other conclusions, that the optimum query size threshold varies across different use cases and different models as well. So in blue, we have the embedding dominated model, and in red, we have the attention dominated model, or one example of the attention dominated models. And then once again, kind of with this hill climbing based scheduler, um, we can find the optimum point, or at least maximize the inference QPS across different model architectures and SLA targets. Wanted to kind of just put all of these results together really quickly. Um, and we compared the automated um, a scheduler to some of the decisions or like a baseline scheduler based on what uh, Facebook's production data center was at least doing at the time. And intuitively the static scheduler, this baseline um, was optimized for a handful of, of models um, hand tuned to maximize uh, paralyzing the, the largest queries across all CPU cores. Um, and then compared to the static scheduler, we find that um, the DeepRexis um, proposed design um, improves uh, 
our system throughput for embedding dominated and retention dominated models by about 6x or uh, 2.6s, 6x um, in both cases. We can also consider um, uh, coprocessors or AI accelerators. And what we see is, at least for the MLP dominated models, we're seeing this large uh, performance improvement, uh, particularly because they're more compute intensive, which is really good for the, for the GPUs. But for some of these other use cases, like the embedded and tension dominant model, we're having limited uh, speed up. And what this translates to is, if you're looking at power efficiency, it's actually maybe not optimal to be uh, offloading some of these queries to uh, GPUs. And so, um, for example, for the embedding dominated model, um, in terms of power efficiency, we're seeing a degradation of about 1.25x. And for attention dominated models, we're seeing a uh, power efficiency degradation of about 2x um, compared to the CPU only approach. But overall, um, what we're finding is that this uh, deep access scheduler can um, flexibly accelerate uh, recommendation across these different use cases, whether it's models or latency targets and hardware platforms. Um, but, the, but the key optimal point is definitely going to vary uh, whether you're looking at performance or power efficiency and the different use cases. Okay, so um, we did, um, in, in addition to kind of the results on the deep access infrastructure, we did also look at this um, in more production use cases. Um, I don't want to get into the details too much here, but um, basically when we're looking at the hill climbing based scheduler, like optimizing these scheduling um, decisions, uh, we found that with Facebook shadow traffic and AB testing, we can actually reduce tail latency by up to 40% um, compared to the previous use solution. And we have about 10 minutes left, so I kind of want to just briefly give some overview on ongoing work that builds on this deep access solution in order to co-design models and specialized hardware. But I'll wait for a minute in case there's questions here as well. Cool, okay, so so far the design optimizations that we're looking at were per we're optimizing hardware efficiency given fixed recommendation models, but kind of coming from the computer vision and NLP domains, um, what we found is that co-designing models and hardware can have significant efficiency improvements um, with maybe small accuracy degradations. But in the context of recommendation, what we see is like even small accuracy degradation, like say 0.1% has a huge impact on users' experiences. This really limits the potential of co-designing models and hardware. But for recommendation, we can actually go beyond optimizing for individual accuracy and think about optimizing for end-to-end -end service quality metrics, which actually opens up new hardware design opportunities. So here we're seeing that um, accuracy corresponds to the ability of a model to correctly predict whether a user's gonna like a particular item. On the other hand, quality um, is built on this notion that um, it's not about a single individual item, but actually ranking a collection of items and finding the best um, uh, handful of them and presenting them to the users. So while accuracy is kind of dependent on model complexity alone, quality is maximized by increasing model complexity and the number of items to rank. And this new dimension opens up um, fun new op opportunities for optimizing quality by trading off model accuracy and performance. And in particular, the intuition is kind of built upon the idea that only a small number of the items in the universe's kind of uh, domain or range of all possible items are relevant to any individual person. And because of this, we can actually decompose individual recommendation models into multiple cascading models to improve efficiencies. 
So here we have a large set of candidate items on the left, and we first process them with filtering models, which are smaller. And then the filtered items are ranked by larger ranking models that are more accurate. And then those final recommendations are presented to the user. And now intuitively cascading the models from left to right, we see that model complexity is increasing in terms of compute um, demands, model, uh, model capacity demands, and also um, the model accuracy. Simultaneously though, the number of items that we're ranking is decreasing from left to, left to right, which means that we're reducing the working set sizes. And decomposing these models into multiple cascading networks uh, reduces the overall system requirements in terms of um, compute and embedding working set sizes. Um, so this improves our overall efficiency of recommendation. And we're starting to see this kind of show up in um, industry use cases as well. So um, in addition to kind of some of the benefits of this, we actually do find that there's new challenges and opportunities for hardware design as well. The first challenge is how do we run multiple models? This requires kind of balancing resources across the different use cases and also eliminating communication overheads. And then the second is going beyond processing just the model inferences, but also looking at um, the, the parts in the middle, like filtering these models, sorting them, um, and doing the data processing. And then finally is uh, these different models exhibit different um, performance bottlenecks. So the front end models are have a high degree of data parallelism and the back end models have a high degree of model parallelism and are optimized for accuracy instead of performance. Kind of how do we design systems for this? So we actually look back at our deep rest infrastructure and started thinking about how can we augment this end-to-end -end infrastructure to consider these cascading networks. We have the same load generator and we have the ability to kind of measure this tail latency and system throughput, um, but we augment the models in the middle to be this kind of trained cascading network. So we conduct this hyperparameter sweep to implement models with different compute and memory capacities. And this allows it to really uh, quantitatively trade off tail latency throughput and recommendation quality. And then given um, our inference schedule, we can actually map these different models and the design space given to us by the hyperparameter suite onto different CPUs and GPUs and also design customized hardware. Kind of just going through very quickly um, what the hardware might look like for this. So uh, we have the workload on, on top of these cascading networks and we start with this baseline recommendation accelerator from, from recent publications. And the idea is that this accelerator has some local embedding cache for uh, improving locality on frequency access embedding vectors. You have the systolic array based MLP unit and you have a separate feature interaction unit. And the host CPU is doing this the in-between operations for filtering and data processing items. Instead, the accelerator that, that we're starting to look at in our ongoing work and proposing is, can we design something that can process multiple queries and multiple models simultaneously? Can we augment this um, embedding cache so that it can cache not just for a single model, but be provisioned to cache vectors across these different networks? And then can we have hardware that can filter and sort these items um, efficiently on chip without going to the whole CPU and incurring some of these costly PCIe communication overheads. Um, so this is definitely ongoing work, um, but I just wanted to give a brief highlight to some of the performance um, benefits that we might be able to see. So Instrumenting this with open source data sets and trained models, at least on CPUs and GPUs, we're seeing that we can reduce tail latency at ISO throughput and quality by 3x and 2x. And compared to our customized, uh, or, or compared to um, previous recommendation accelerators, we can um, improve tail latency and throughput by 3x and 6x as well. Okay, so kind of just wanted to briefly spend a minute on some of our other work on open sourcing these tools and resources. 
Um, so one of the challenges, like we mentioned for a recommendation was a lot of these use cases are kind of hidden behind um, industry systems and um, are kind of found in industry. So we have been trying to open source um, and make them um, as available as possible. So the first part of this was Facebook's DLRM model that, that was open sourced and um, made a part of MLPerf. The DeepRexis infrastructure is also open source. And actually some of the query size and the load generation characteristics were merged with the MLPerf instance benchmark as well. And then finally, we've been hosting this personal tutorial and, and workshop um, on trying to build this broader community on developing systems and hardware for recommendation use cases. Okay, so that's an overview of some of the recommendation stuff that we've been working on. And maybe I'll just pause there because I know it's one o'clock and people might need to drop out, but um, I'm also happy to continue going on for another five minutes if people want to hear more about some of the sustainability work that we've been doing and looking beyond efficiency. But also if there's questions, I'm happy to answer those. Maybe I'll just spend a couple minutes talking about some of our work looking beyond efficiency and um, I'll make the slides available as well in case people have to drop out um, before we kind of wrap this part up. Um, but so far we've been looking at um, optimizing efficiency for a recommendation, but something that I'm really interested in and um, working on now is how can we build responsible recommendation systems. So there's three kind of parts to this. One is fair and interpretable recommendation systems. So we are starting to look at some of these emerging graph neural networks, which are um, really good about offering higher interpretability. So I think somebody mentioned one of the benefits for graph neural networks, like this is one big benefit of that. Um, how can we offer private recommendations? And then the, the third category really being um, how can we offer sustainable recommendations? And what does sustainability really mean um, for, for recommendation and AI, and I guess computing more generally? And so kind of just doing a bit of a deep dive here, um, we're actually seeing a lot of companies starting to pledge um, carbon neutrality, um, including Facebook, Google, Microsoft, um, Amazon, Apple, and so on. Um, and so the, the question, that's kind of interesting is what does carbon neutrality really mean for computing and what role can computer systems and architectures uh, researchers play in achieving sustainable computing going forward? And the way that we're starting to think about this is kind of borrowing from environmental science and environmental engineering and using these tools called life cycle analyses. Study the breakdown of carbon emissions across different hardware platforms or different use cases. These LCAs are frequently used to quantify the emissions across four phases of any product. This includes hardware platforms, but it can be for any product that, that you use. Um, so the first phase is manufacturing, the second is transporting um, from fabs to, to users and the different use cases. The third is actually using the hardware device. And then the final phase is recycling and end of hardware life cycle processing. But typically when we think about sustainability, we think about considering the carbon footprint from um, using these hardware systems and in particular the energy consumption. But what some of our work is starting to show us is actually um, the carbon footprint from manufacturing hardware um, can be a significant portion depending on the type of device and the use cases. Um, and in many cases, it actually dominate the overall carbon footprint across the entire hardware life cycle. So here, when we think about product use emissions being at kind of like the operational emissions or the OPEX related emissions, 
the manufacturing ones are more CapEx related, coming from some of the data center term terminology. So what does this look like? like how can we use these large cycle analyses? Um, so here's just a quick example of that. So on the x-axis, we have uh, eight different types of mobile hardware devices. On the y-axis, we have the absolute carbon footprint. Then black has the total carbon footprint of the device over its lifetime. So about three years of using it. And then red is the production. And then green is um, the uh, use-related emissions. And what we see on the right side here is for some of these always connected and plugged in devices like personal assistants and desktops, um, energy consumption dominates the um, carbon footprint of these devices, kind of following from some of our intuition. But for these battery operated devices, um, we're actually seeing that manufacturing is dominating almost like 75% of the end to end life cycle emissions of these platforms. And about one third of it is. And, and about like one third of like Apple's overall footprint is actually coming from manufacturing SOCs and DRAMs and, and then flash um, uh, devices and other integrated circuits as well. And so this is kind of like just a, 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 um, a great place for hardware designers and architects to kind of enter and think about how can we design these hardware platforms to be more efficient from the ground up. And in addition to some of the mobile footprints, we can also see the similar trends on the data center side. Um, I'm just gonna walk through this uh, picture a little bit. The scope three is the CapEx related emissions or the infrastructure related emissions. And the green component is the operational or the energy that goes into the data centers. And on the blue is um, the more uh, business oriented uh, carbon emissions like um, powering refrigerator, powering offices, um, some of the refrigerants and gases that are used to, to power offices as well. Um, and here we're looking at like Facebook's overall carbon footprint and I apologize for this, but it looks like the x-axis got cut off, but that's basically different years going from 2014 to I believe 2019. So each of the years, I mean, on the y-axis we see the carbon footprint um, in each of these categories and kind of once again, following from some of our mobile analysis, we're starting to see that these scope three emissions or these CapEx related emissions are really dominating the overall carbon footprint of, um, of data centers. And so once again, I'm trying to think about where, where can we design or provision hardware systems um, more efficiently to kind of reduce some of these overheads um, and reduce the carbon footprint of computing um, overall. Any questions on that point? That's a lot of information to take in. Yeah, um, I didn't have any questions on the carbon footprint. Um, and of course, if anyone needs to drop off, we're over time, so you can just drop off. Um, but I, I had more of a question on the ethics and the of choosing the loss function or the, the objective function for some of these models. It's less on the system side. I don't know how much you'd be involved here, but um, but there's, there seems to be trade-offs between whether you want to optimize for engagement or some type of interaction for the user and whether you actually, which might lead to some type of negative effects, which a lot of people are aware of today, and whether you want to actually optimize for um, something that's more, well, ethical in some ways um, that doesn't have as, as bad as side effects. For example, if in Facebook's case, optimize for more positive news or more positive posts from friends. And um, I'm wondering if that's actually playing a, a role now in a lot of these engines and um, if that actually changes. I, I can't see any effects on the hardware, but what role that would actually play. Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, kind of just reiterating that. Are there other metrics that we can look at beyond engagement and whether people are gonna like something um, and maybe kind of looking at these more ethical metrics. And I know that there's a lot of ongoing work from the AI community looking at that, um, looking at can we quantify like the, the goodness of something in terms of um, the more the scholastic value that, that it provides um, 
and reducing some of the negative impacts of, of recommendation perhaps. And yeah, I, I haven't seen like how that would really impact um, the system design side right now, but I can imagine that we can have different types of models. Like um, one reason that people are starting to look at graph neural networks is particularly because they can offer this um, feature of higher interpretability. So you can at least understand why certain recommendations are being made. And that can hopefully at least guide you towards um, why are these models making predictions that they are? And is there a better way to design them? Um, and those graph models definitely have um, very unique and different system implications as well, which I think are a great place for systems and architecture researchers to, to play a role in. Actually, in terms of sustainability, there's interesting, um, I think there's been like one or two proposals on like, can we recommend green content, like quantify the um, environmental friendliness of certain items or products um, and add that as a feature in order to guide people to be more environmentally conscious. Um, That's interesting. That would be really interesting and fun to explore as well. Cool. Well, that was actually the end of all the content I wanted to go over. I'll just give a brief shout out to the CLEAR workshop that we're going to host, be hosting at ISCA. Um, it's going to be talking about the competing landscapes for environmental accountability and responsibility. So if you're interested in that, please definitely join. Um, and just a shout out to all of our um, collaborators um, helping and being part of this journey.